Beats, and today we are talking about identity with Nicole Parker. Nicole, why don't you introduce yourself to those watching and tell us a little bit about you, your family, your ministry. All right, well, um, I'm a homeschooling mom, but I have a biblical counseling master's degree, and my husband, Alan, is a professor, so He's the one who makes money. I'm the one who stays at home and teaches the kids. We have a wonderful ministry together. We've been married for 14 years, and I'm just so blessed. I'm married to the man of my dreams. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was a time in my life when I thought that was impossible. I was sure that God could never bring me somebody wonderful, that I didn't deserve somebody, and no quality guy would ever be interested in me. But God just turned that around for me completely. So I'm so blessed. I'm so grateful to him. And we we love ministering as a team. We have a, a website called heartthirst.com, like a thirsty heart. Just think of a heart getting a drink of water. Heartthirst.com. And there we share some of our favorite resources and um, our own testimonies and just a lot of different seminars on how to build a closer walk with God and how to find godly self-worth in Him and things like that. Nicole, that's amazing. And it sounds like you've probably worked with teenagers before. Could I guess that from, from your ministry? Yes, I spent a lot of time working with teenagers. I used to be a college uh, girls dean, assistant dean, and uh, working as a dean just for a very small school where we were um, learning to study the Bible, sharing the gospel with others, and I really loved it. I also taught high school English for a little while, and um, living right here by a college campus, I spent a lot of time with students, too. I really enjoy that. That's so cool. Um, I know that in this topic of identity, just hearing a little bit about um, what you were saying about your own self-worth and search for that, you've probably got some something important to say about that search for identity in Christ. Do you mind telling us a little bit about your personal story? You know, I've been so blessed. When I was growing up, I, I looked through some of my old report cards from elementary school not long ago, and I saw, you know, just consistently all through them, teachers were sharing what we would now call low self-esteem issues. Nicole has problems with needing attention, seeks undue attention, has all these, you know, a whole list of things that were really just low self-esteem issues, what we would call them that now. But what I didn't understand was that God didn't want me to build worldly self-esteem. You know, I remember trying to build who I was based on, you know, my favorite colors and my favorite music and the kinds of clothes I like to wear, the kinds of friends I wanted to hang out with and, you know, my talents all of those things. And I didn't realize that it's all just building on nothing if we're trying to build on what makes us unique. What I needed to understand, and I only grew to understand later on in life, is where we need to build our godly self-worth is on what makes us the same as every other person, that we're created in the image of God and redeemed by the blood of Christ. That's the measure of how much we're loved and how much we're worth. Was there a time when you... Like, can you think back or take us back to when that recognition started happening? What was going on in your life or how is it that you came to understand this? I think it would be super valuable for parents and those who work with, with teens to understand what can cause that shift. What did it for you? You know, it was, uh, I know exactly when it happened. I was struggling with major depression and anxiety issues. I'd gone through a lot growing up, which is uh, something I share a little bit more when I share my testimony on our website, heartthirst.com. Um, in that I tell a little bit more of what was going on in my life, but I was struggling with serious issues and contemplating suicide. And then I decided, you know, I've gone to church every week growing up. And the one thing that really sticks out in my mind is everybody says you have to do the God thing, but you have to give it 100% or else it won't work. So I decided I was going to just give myself completely to God for a year and see what he did. And I changed schools right then, went to uh, a new Christian school. And in my Bible class, the textbook we were assigned to read was called The Desire of Ages. It's the story of the life of Christ. 
And when I started reading that book, it just blew my mind. I remember finishing the first chapter and I just got tears in my eyes and I thought, I've never heard of a Jesus like this. Hmm. If that's what he's like, maybe I actually could serve him and trust him with my life. Amen. So that was around the time I turned 17 that I decided I really wanted to give my life entirely to Christ. And from there on, he just kept leading me moment by moment. There were still some dark times. I still struggled a lot with feeling like I was inadequate, like no one would ever see me as a valuable person. But God was so good and just led me along gently as I was ready to understand. Wow. It sounds like that that seeing Jesus helped you see yourself. Is that a fair statement? Yes. You know, the more I understand of the character of God, the more I understand how much he loves me. And this is the central thing that people need to understand with identity issues. I was looking so hard at myself, trying to find something that would make me feel like I was worth something. I wanted to be popular. I tried so hard to get good grades because I knew I was smart. And so that was where I hung my sense of worth. If I got good grades, I was good. If I was popular, I was good. And if those things didn't work out, then I felt like trash. And then God had to keep bringing me back over the same ground to understand, no, you're not more valuable because you're smart. You're not more valuable because you're popular or pretty or anything else. If those things increased my value, then I would naturally start looking down on those who didn't have those things. And that's the foundation of racism and sexism and any kind of looking down on others. If I'm good at something, then I start looking down on others who aren't as good at that. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's the basis of all kinds of discrimination. Yeah, I think you just gave me some, some food for thought there. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to get into a little bit of some practical advice for those watching because I think you are uniquely qualified and have talked with so many different people, I think probably from different backgrounds. Um, you told me that you helped to create a seminar called I Love Me, I Love Me Not. Would you tell me a little bit about this seminar and um, maybe some of the things, some of the, the nuggets of goodness you can share with those working with um, young ladies in that? Sure. It's a seminar that's available for free online, also on our website, heartthirst.com. And um, it was two hours, so it's kind of a lot to cram in there. <laughs> but in a nutshell, um, we talked about how worldly self-esteem is built on looking at ourselves as unique and therefore priceless. Mm -hmm. And godly self-worth is not like worldly self-esteem. You know, we've all grown up with hearing these Sesame Street things, you know, there's no one as special as you kind of stuff. And those kinds of things tend to make us trample on others when we don't feel secure. Build some narcissism in there instead of... Right. And um, so we talk about the whole self-esteem movement and how it began in America and how it's taken off around the world. And then compare and contrast that with a biblical view of godly self-worth. Because you see, the thing is, the more that I look at myself, the more I'm going to go up and down with the waves. But every one of us craves identity because we're created as worshipers. God has created us to worship and to find our highest fulfillment in his love. Whoever it is that I get my identity from, whether it's somebody who pays attention to me or maybe it's my, you know, my talents, my abilities to go rock climbing or you know, anything that I think makes me more special than others, if I get my identity from that, I will worship that. Mm. And that will be the foundation of why I believe I'm loved and valuable. But then that's going to go up and down with the tide. And, you know, if I find myself esteem in how well I play the piano or how well I do at gymnastics, then I'm always going to be watching to see that nobody gets better than me. And there's always going to be somebody better than me. So do you think that fosters a spirit of competition to instead of being able to to encourage and, and love each other? Is that yes. what happens out of that? And that competition, that competitive spirit really fuels anxiety and depression. If I see I'm not as good as others, then I'm going to spiral into depression and that will lead to escapist behaviors, you know, overeating or 
compulsive movie watching or something, you know, and often we just change places from one addiction to another to another. We just go through a cycle of them because we're just trying to escape from our sense of worthlessness or anxiety. If I feel like I really am the best, then I have to stay the best. And so it's going to be fueling that continual drive to achieve so that I will continue to be valuable and lovable. Wow. Yeah. So where does the I love me not part? I mean, I know it's a little play on uh, he loves me, he loves me not. But um, what is the what do you see? What um, what's the I love me not side about in this in this seminar? You know, I was just trying to talk about how we go up and down with the waves unless we build on the rock. If I'm building on the sand, then I'm always swept away by when I don't do as well as I wanted to do. And if I do do as well as I wanted to do, then I feel like everyone else is less than me. So oh, yeah. understanding that God loves me just the way I am, that there's nothing I can do that can possibly add the slightest bit to my value in his sight. And there's nothing I can possibly do that can take away from my value in the slightest way in his sight. Understanding that is the beginning of true freedom, true self-worth. When I find my worth in the cross, in the fact that he paid in blood for me, there's nothing higher than that. You know, everything in the scriptures points to two great themes, creation, and recreation or redemption. Hmm. And both of those, at the heart of those two themes, is the idea that I am created in the image of God, redeemed by the blood of Christ. I am priceless. I am loved by him. I am valued by him. When we get our sense of love and worth every day from spending time with God, we build on a foundation that doesn't go up and down with the waves. For some reason, I feel like there should be um, soft organ music playing and that you should make a call. I'm feeling stirred <laughs> and moved. Um, as we close here, I'd love to hear from you. You know, there are so many, so many beautiful young women who need to hear your message and the message about their identity in Christ. Um, and there are willing volunteers. I mean, there are people watching this now who, yes, you know, I can talk with these girls. Yes, I can be a role model for them. I can try to lead them to a true identity in Christ. Could you just leave us with one piece of advice? If they were going to say one thing to these young girls this week at church or, or at their school or something, um, what verse or what thought or what um, advice would you have for these leaders trying to lead our young women? You know, the greatest thing we can do for any young person is to help them to connect deeply with Christ for their sense of love and worth. Um, it's as if we're reaching one hand up toward heaven and reaching our other hand down to grab them. And then we bring them together. We bring them up to take the hand of Christ. But we know they're going to slip. They're going to keep falling away. So we have to keep grabbing their hand, keep bringing them back to Christ. Many of our young people have no idea how to really connect with God through study of the Bible, through prayer. We're such a distracted culture that we can't even make it through 30 seconds of prayer without going to, oh, wait, let me just go check my phone quickly. Hmm. So helping young people understand that God longs to connect with them deeply is the most important thing we can do. Sometimes their parents haven't wanted to connect with them in meaningful ways, and they feel like God is a lot like their parents. Maybe if they do everything perfectly, then God will accept them. Or now they've messed up, so God is turning his back on them. But maybe if they just beat themselves up long enough, I'm sorry I watched that. I'm sorry I did that. Maybe he'll finally say, all right, all right, I'll let you back, but don't mess up again. Those kinds of perceptions of the character of God are so destructive mm -hmm. to young people's devotional life. So sometimes you'll minister to somebody who just can't even see Christ in the pages of scripture, can't even feel like they connect with him in prayer. And in those times, you know, keep directing them to the scriptures and to prayer by all means, but sometimes we have to image God to them in ways that help them to believe that he is loving. You know, some of my girls have called me up at different times, you know, I don't even know how many pregnancy tests I've taken on the phone with these girls, you know, and they're not even telling their moms sometimes. Mm -hmm. They're telling me. I'm pregnant or I'm afraid I'm pregnant. What do I do, Mrs. Parker? And 
being there for them. Sometimes I've just had to say when they're like, I just don't feel like anyone could love me. I've said, why do you call me? Why do you still believe that I love you? Mm -hmm. And they'll answer, you know, because you always do. And that's when I can say, that's because God loves you. It's just him flowing through me. If there's anything you can do to help a person to connect deeply with God, either by telling them, study your Bible, pray, maybe studying the Bible with them, sitting down and going through a story of Jesus and saying, imagine yourself here in this story. Imagine what it would be like to be one of the people in this crowd. Imagine what it would be like to be this blind person being healed by Jesus. Go through a story of Jesus with them. Pray with them. Help them to see this is how you connect with him. And even when they aren't willing to do those things, image him to them. Show them this is what Jesus is like. Because often you're the first Jesus that they've really seen. Yeah, that's too bad. I have people ask me all the time, like, hey, are the courses you're creating for troubled girls? And for the most part, I don't know very many girls who aren't troubled. And no, so no, I always aren't troubled, <laughs> myself included. All of us are stumbling along, learning how to grow into the image of Christ. And I think sometimes we really need to help girls understand it's not where you are on that path to perfection that matters. It's which way you're facing. It's which way you're stepping. Amen. I like that. Well, Nicole, I just want to thank you again for your time. And I want to give you an opportunity to um, let people know how they can contact you if they have questions. I know your time is limited, but um, to direct people to some of those resources, either that you've created yourself or that you find really helpful as we close out here. Yeah, um, you can contact me on our website. Um, you'll find an email address, ministry at heart thirst.com again it's like a thirsty heart getting a drink ministry at heart thirst.com you can email me there or you can always just look up all the resources we have listed there we have dozens of seminars that we've done on building godly self-worth on connecting with god on making the bible into something that you can actually connect with god in instead of just something that you have to read a few chapters every day so you can check it off your list and not feel guilty mm -hmm. um just wanting to know how to connect with Christ is so powerful. There are several really good books that I would recommend on um, ccef.org, Christian Counseling and Education Foundation. ccef.org has a great book called When People Are Big and God is Small that I highly recommend. It really helps to get to the, the heart of some of the issues of why we turn to people instead of to God, with codependency, with addictions, with um, peer pressure. Why are we powerless to break free from some of these things that we know are harmful or dangerous? Mm -hmm. So there are several books on there I really recommend. For those who have been abused, maybe the book Shame Interrupted will be very helpful, or The Wounded Heart by um, Dan Allender is excellent. Um, just those who are struggling to connect with God, again, the, the book, The Desire of Ages, was life transforming for me. It's like a, a harmony of the four Gospels put together in story form. So it goes through the life of Christ from the beginning all the way to the end and has Bible references at the beginning of most of the chapters so you can see where the story comes from. It's just beautiful. I really loved it because it made the Bible come alive for me. It tells a lot of things we wouldn't know ordinarily about Jewish history or about what things were like in Jesus' time, like who are the Pharisees. So it, it's a powerful book. And just the main thing is connect with Christ through the Bible and through prayer. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate your contribution to this course. And um, I will be seeing you soon somewhere, I really hope. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Amy. Bye.